Hey, I want to welcome you to the Love First podcast, and we are excited about this. Now, to be honest with you, we've been thinking about it for a while, but the coronavirus kicked us into gear. And so thanks for joining us. And our plan is to uh, share this uh, out every Wednesday. So we hope that you'll join us and we'll say a little bit more about that. But because it's the first one and it's kind of under a little bit of unusual circumstances, um, my name is Don McLaughlin. I am one of the ministers for the North Atlanta Church of Christ in Atlanta, Georgia. And if you go on our website at lovefirst.org, you'll get to know us a little bit. But I want to take care of some housekeeping for our church family, and we'd love for you to listen in. And who knows, uh, you might pick up a few ideas for your church family, and you might even later submit some ideas for us to help us as well. So let me talk about housekeeping. First of all, uh, last week, I want to thank all of you for tuning in to our worship online. Now, that was pretty crazy because we were coordinating through prayer with conversations with the members and the leadership of our church, with the state government, with our county and city government. And on Thursday, we were finally able to pull the trigger, make the decision, and then with the help of fantastic tech team. Uh, some of you whom are here today, so I'll give a quick shout out to Nolan and to Caleb and to Abby and to everyone they represent uh, I just want to say thank you, and I want to thank all of you for adjusting so quickly. We had fantastic feedback of people reaching out to each other. A few people now know what a Zoom meeting is. Who did not know before? And a few people finally figured out what to do with their Skype account. So I just want to say thank you to all of you for doing that, and we're going to grow in this, so we will appreciate your feedback. We've had a lot of really positive feedback, and we were able to get some feedback for ways to grow and improve, and we're going to be working on that every week. So this coming Sunday will be similar to last Sunday. It'll be online, as you know, uh, from the federal government all the way down through the city government, our local government, uh, we have been encouraged to not even meet in groups of more than 10, let alone large church gatherings. So we're going to honor that, but we're going to grow. So we're going to take this a step further, a step deeper. We're going to up our game. So we are looking at worship, connection, and discipleship. Hey, this is the body of Christ, no matter what the circumstances, right? So throughout the generations around the world, no matter what in the world's going on, war, pestilence, hey, uh, the gates of hell cannot prevail, right? And so this is what we're going to do. So what I want you to do is be thinking, ah, okay, so what's my part in that? If the church is going to be working hard at this labor of love to produce this for us, what's our part? What's our part in connecting with God, with each other, and with the world around us, specifically our neighbors? So we want you to be thinking about that. Now, uh, in order to improve what we're doing, this coming Sunday will be similar but slightly different. Now, let me tell you about that. So as we were reviewing the feedback and uh really honestly, trying to hear the heart of our shepherds, the heart of our ministry team. Here's what we heard. We need to emphasize connection. We need to make sure that we're not uh, leaning into some kind of outcome that creates less connection and more individualism. So this is about body life. So what we're going to do is this Sunday, we are going to air the worship uh, uh, online at 10 o'clock. It will come online at 10 a.m. for everyone, okay? Uh, the way we're going to film this for this weekend is, or produce it, was, we'll begin with a cappella worship on the front end. And then we're going to have our communion thoughts, our contribution thoughts, and the sermon. Then we're going to close with our instrumental worship. So we're going to have one worship. It'll air at 10 o'clock. The a cappella worship will come first then contribution and communion and the sermon time, and then uh, we'll have the instrumental worship after. So we're looking forward to this because we want to increase the idea that, hey, we're still one family, still one body and community with each other. You also know that you can pick up communion cups. Now, here's what I found out. A lot of people did this. A lot of families went and at the five different locations, including the church building, picked up individual communion cups. Those were in sealed plastic bags. It was done very nicely. But I also heard 
that many folks ended up cooking their own communion bread. And how cool is that? Now, I found out that a few of you need a better recipe. I ain't calling anyone out, but let's up our game there as well. But uh, we had some of grandma's recipe that had been passed down through the years, and I thought that was really beautiful. As a granddaughter in our church, cook communion bread for the first time using her grandmother's recipe. Now, what about that? Isn't that a beautiful teaching moment and an expression of love? So these are some things that we're going to do, and I just want you to think about it. A few more things that I want to say as far as housekeeping. Hey, Don. Yeah. Hey, this is Nolan. Say Everybody say thanks to Nolan in your prayers. All right, go ahead. Coming in off camera, uh, I just wanted to say one other big part about joining at 10 a.m. Yes. Is that we'll, we'll have some prompts for people to be able to to uh, comment and engage with each other during that live period. But of course, the worship will be available anytime after 10, but we really wanted to make it available that where we could comment back and forth. So uh, I'm imagining your sermon will probably have some questions, cool. discussion questions and things like that. I uh, just wanted to put that note in there as to why it's important, if you can, to join us at 10 a.m. live. Oh, that's, that's cool. Okay, hey, that's cool. So I hope you heard everything that Nolan uh, shared there. But one of the ways that we're going to emphasize that sense of connectivity is when we all join at 10 a.m., then we will have opportunity online to comment live, offer our prayer requests live, to be able to share together like that. So that's great. And Nolan, thank you so much for that update. Uh, also, one thing we'd like to talk about is this. When you think about the church throughout history, you know, some of these, uh, some of the books that have been written over the several decades about the ways that people responded, whether it be during times of martyrdom or times of war or times of imprisonment, all of these things that our brothers and sisters throughout the ages have gone through, people have followed the Holy Spirit and found ways to connect. I, I remember reading about some people that were prisoners of war, and during that wartime, they figured out that people in the next cell who they could not see could hear them tapping on the wall and using Morse code, they would share hymns with each other. Listen, through Morse code, they sang, how great thou art with each other. So surely in that tradition, we can do this, right? A couple more housekeeping things. Uh, Throughout our uh, history of missions at our church, that's a big deal for us, and our students are being trained through missions starting in the sixth grade all the way up through the first year of college. One of the great themes of that mission training is this, trust and adjust. And so we want to think about that because what trust means is, hey, you got to respond to what's right in front of you. One time, one of our mission teams was headed to another country, and shortly before, we, were, we already had our tickets bought for 60-some students and, and chaperones, and then there was a coup in that country. And so what does trust mean? We can't go. We've got to respond to the moment. One of our uh, ministers said to us something that was really powerful. You want to meet the moment that you're in with the gospel of peace and justice. And so we thought, all right, we can't go there. But, but then adjust means, well, then how is God working? So trust means we just got to face what's in front of us, right? Face the coronavirus, face what's happening. But it just says, hey, we're looking for God in this. We're going to join God in this. We're going to join God in mission. So let's just remember that the Holy Spirit knows what to do and the Holy Spirit will lead us. A couple more housekeeping thoughts. Um, giving. This is incredibly important. One of the ministers that I've worked with for over 23 years, Ken Snell, he talks about it like this. He said, if you could think about giving like a function of your body, we have giving like from our mind, head giving, and then we have heart giving, and then we have hands giving. So head giving is where I stop and I listen to the scripture, and I, and I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and I just realize that there are things we cannot tackle on our own and we need the body of Christ to tackle this. So one of the reasons that my wife and I have tithed for over 38 years together, and one of the reasons we tithe to our church is because we want to be a part of meeting needs that are just too big for our budget. But if we give to the local body of Christ and we support that ministry and you give to the local body of Christ and you support that ministry, guess what? People's needs are being met that on our own we would not be able to meet. We might not even know about them. 
One of the great ministries of this church is to people in recovery. Another one is our counseling center. Can you imagine how important both of those ministries are right now, given the coronavirus? Think about how important they are. We need to give to be able to support those ministries so that people's needs can be met, that lives and families can be made whole. So let's make sure that during this time, we understand the importance of that kind of giving. It really matters. You can go online at give.nacfc.org. You can go online at lovefirst.org as well and navigate that. But if you go online at give.nacfc.org, you can share your contribution there, and it's going to make a huge difference. We have staff here at North Atlanta that serve all week long, and they are working. Right now, we're working all day and all night to meet the needs of this crisis. And so we desperately need you to support the ministry to make sure that when, we, when people call us and say, can you help, our answer is in love, yes. So we need your help with that. So I appreciate that very much. The church needs to be a light in the community. The church needs to have its, its heart open to the community. Now, a second kind of giving that I would talk about would be heart giving. And that's the kind of thing where you just realize that there's people around you that have touched your heart. You're going to reach out to their needs. And that could be in all kinds of giving. That could be in, you know, giving your influence, your finances, your time, your service. And there's all kinds of ideas out there on the internet that are just beautiful expressions of that kind of love. But there's a third kind of giving, and that's the giving right from hands. The scripture calls that alms giving. It just says there's someone right in front of you, and they need a little help. And it is within your capacity to help them. See, that's a little bit different, the different kinds of giving. Some of it, it takes everyone to meet a huge need. Some of us, that need is just right on, right on time with us. It's the right size for us to participate in. So make sure you do something like that. So those are some ideas on that. Everything that uh, you need on this digitally, everything you want to look for is found on our website. So you can either go to lovefirst.org or nacfc.org. Both of those addresses end up at the same landing page. Everything you need is on that landing page. You'll be able to find it there. So we'd ask you to do that. Also want to uh, make known to you uh, that we're going to stay up to date with engagement on social media. So keep your eyes uh, open every day for things that'll come out on Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And I also want you to do this. If this podcast is helpful to you, I want you to click like, and I want you to subscribe. Now, why do I want you to do that? Because that's how you can pass the good, good news on to other people. That's how we can help as many people as possible. Isn't that what we want to do? See, we have love first. And what does that mean? It means that we love because God first loved us. But do you hear the equation in there? As God has loved us, we liked and subscribed. And now what does that do for us? That says, hey, pass it on, right? Love forward. This is what we've got to do. Uh, you can uh, also know this. On the website, there will be a place for you to submit your questions. And I've already got some that we'll address today. So as we go through our content today, we're going to come to a QA. and a And uh, I'm going to address three different questions that people have already submitted. But what I'm saying to you is, is as you think through uh, what we share today, I'd, I'd love for you to just go to that comment page and, uh, and share, hey, here's a question. This is something I'm thinking about, and then we'll address it in future uh, podcasts. So real quickly, uh, Caleb, Abby, Nolan, is there anything I forgot that we need to share? All right, we good? good. All right, fantastic. Well, I hope all of you will thank God for those that are making this happen, especially uh, those that are here today producing this. So today... I thought the place we got to begin is with our questions. We got a lot of questions. People are wondering, can we do this? How will it affect me? Here's some of the questions. What's happening? How are we to understand this coronavirus? How do we understand and navigate the way it's impacting our individual lives and our families and our world? How do we do what we've got to do every day? How do we reimagine the future given that the virus seems to impact 
everything in our world, great or small? My guess is these are some of the questions you've been wondering, and maybe you've been okay to just blurt them out. Maybe you've just vented uh, to family or friends or online, or you might have tucked these away inside you because you didn't want to alarm other people. I bet for some of you, you're trying to think, how do I myself in some way come across as brave or together when inside my anxiety really is kind of high. So let's talk about this for a little bit. How do we handle this? So in doing some research and reading some articles, I, I came across this idea that the answers aren't identical for everyone, right? So how are we going to navigate this? How do we move forward? What's the future look like? Well, that isn't identical for everyone. See, for some people that have been like infected, tested positive and infected, for some of them, you do realize they've already died. And that's what highlights the seriousness of this. We recognize, well, this could be fatal. Now, when you do models of, of uh, viruses and you look at like um, the percentage of death toll with Ebola, Western Africa, a little over 37%. What just happened in the Democratic Republic of Congo, up over 60%. Then you might say to yourself, whoa, 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 okay. So with some epidemics, with some viruses, the death rate ratio is way higher than the coronavirus. Well, that's actually true. Worldwide, it looks like that the death rate is around 4%. So yeah, that is a big deal. But I want you to think about what happened over the weekend, where Italy had 368 deaths in one 24-hour period. So on the one hand, we can have like hope that the death rate is not as high as some viruses, that really doesn't comfort anyone who's already lost a loved one. That doesn't somehow say to people that are already ill, hey, you got nothing to worry about. People do share with us the recovery rate. Is that not encouraging? How many people are recovering? Yeah, that's encouraging. You know what else is encouraging? In places that were on the front end of this, like places in Asia, when we think about like South Korea or Singapore or China or some of these other countries that were on the front end. And we can already see that they've got their legs under them. They've already made progress. That help is coming our way from their progress. Isn't that great? Yes, that's wonderful. You got to remember, we're behind the curve on that. So what they've already started addressing and had some success in addressing, we're on the front end of addressing it. So yes, it's hopeful that people are finding ways to navigate this, but we're in the middle of it, and that feels a certain kind of way. I think a way to think about it would be this. If someone finds out that there's a way to put out a fire, that's dynamite, and we're so glad that they figured it out. But if my house is on fire, I'm feeling a different kind of way. So the fact that they've made some progress in some of these countries to help us see steps we need to take, great. But for us, we're starting to have to navigate some things that are very uncomfortable. It seems like every day there's some new sacrifice that people here need to make. You know, you remember it kind of went from, well, maybe this school will close. Well, uh, maybe, maybe this school district will close. Oh, okay. Well, maybe it's going to be elementary schools that will close. And then the entire education system is shut down. All of a sudden, we go from a few people being impacted to nationwide concerns and responses. That naturally impacts us. So when we think about these questions, can we just not admit they're fairly diverse in how they hit us and the kind of answers that we need? If you were an epidemiologist, someone who has given their life, training, and experience to try to understand in epidemics, or if you're a virologist, your, your whole job in life is to understand viruses and how they form, how they're named, how they're treated, how we move beyond them. If that's your whole life, then you've got some pretty, pretty concrete questions and some concrete answers. Think about it like this. If you're an infectious disease physician, 
You're looking for concrete answers. You want the data of the sciences to come and bear on how the virus is understood. Listen to this, how it's named. You know the history of this. Back in the 60s, as this virus was beginning to be better understood, and then we saw around 2003 when we heard this new thing called SARS in Singapore, and my family actually went to Singapore during that time, and we got to see firsthand what was happening through that. But in a sense, this is also, you realize, a SARS virus. And when someone calls this COVID-19, it's because this COVID virus is known under other circumstances and other strains, okay? So why do they call it novel? It's because this is a new strain. Some people say, ah, man, it's just a cold, it's just the flu. I hear what you're saying. And I think sometimes I don't want to assess motives. Maybe the reason we're saying that is we want to project calm or we're kind of fearful. But in the end, I just want to put this out there. That's a little irresponsible because it's not just the cold and it's not just the flu. So let's take a little more responsible approach to this. Think about it like this. Now think about this. You go to get gas. You're at the gas pump. There are three to five options, right? You've got your 87, your 89, and you've got your 93, right? But you've also got diesel on one end of this pump, and then you've got ethanol on the other end of the, or 85 on the other end of the pump. If you said to someone, ah, man, it's all gas, it doesn't matter, that could ruin your car. So yeah, it's all fuel, but it isn't the same strain. So when you think of the virus, think, okay, yes, we understand viruses, but this is a different kind of virus. So quit saying, ah, oh, it's just a flu or it's just a cold. Ah, people are going nuts over nothing. Because that's not true and that's not responsible. When I was a little kid, uh, before they made some adjustments to the gas nozzles on cars, one of my parents, and I won't say which one, <clears throat> mom, but uh, one of them accidentally filled our 1963 Plymouth Belvedere station wagon with diesel. It was gas, it was an accident. We made it about a mile up the road before our car literally looked like a house on fire going down the road. The smoke is so far around us, it's like NASCAR at the end when he wins and he's spinning, you know, burning the tires up, spinning in a big circle. It was nuts. We pull off the side of the road, we pile out of the car, and everybody's wondering what in the world happened. Is the car on fire? No, we just put the wrong fuel in the tank. Now, do you get what we're saying? It's not like any other virus. It's not like any other flu. It's unique. And the people that have to work on this, they know that and they need to know it. Because if you've got an epidemiologist who doesn't know the difference between a common cold and COVID-19, that epidemiologist will be of no value to us and no help. So why don't all of us accept that there's a little more to it? But now I wanna to shift to another group of people that are really important than this, a second group, and that's sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists. You see, for them, it's a mixture of quantitative and qualitative data. They've gotta sift through it, discern it. They've gotta culturally consider it. In this rapidly changing study, we've gotta think about history, cultural competence, possible models of human responses of fear and anxiety. One news article asked this question, how long will social distancing last, right? How long are we gonna be cooped up, right? How long are we gonna have, a, a, you know, a whole bunch of people in our nest that weren't in it a few weeks ago, right? So what about families whose college students have come home? What about families who are all of a sudden trying to figure out how to help their, you know, their third grader do online education? This isn't the easiest thing in the world. So they asked that question. Now I want you to see a little bit of the complexity of this. You ready for this? So Dr. Chris Whitty, who's the chief medical officer for England, he's, that's his job, Dr. Chris Whitty. He noted, well, if you move too early, people will get fatigued. That comment went online and people went nuts. 
His comment drew angry responses from the UK medical community for seemingly being tone deaf to the enormity of risk for this virus. I want to suggest that, yes, their primary criticism was right, that the pain and fatigue of moving too soon is nothing compared to the devastation of moving too late. But, but Dr. Witte was acknowledging a true concern. How will humans handle the social isolation and upheaval of their lifestyle and for how long? Now, his approach was medically foolish and irresponsible, okay? But his social concern was not unfounded. We do wonder, man, how long can we handle this? Am I gonna go stir crazy, right? Well, let me give you another side to this. Dr. Natalie Dean. Now, Dr. Natalie Dean is a biostatistician with the University of Florida. I know, I can hear some of my elders right now, go Gators, oh my goodness gracious. That is another infection altogether, people. I just have to put that out there. Sorry about that, but it's the real thing. All right, but Dr. Dean, she's at the University of Florida. Here's what she said. I don't know if people are ready for how long they're probably going to have to keep up this social distancing. But as they see the hospital situation get more extreme, I think their attitude will change. Now, do you hear what she's suggesting? That, yeah, maybe today I'm like, man, I'm at my wit's end. I don't know if I can handle this. But as you see other elements of the virus unfold, uh, yesterday, um, one of our sons gave us a call and asked us to pray for a childhood friend who has tested positive for the coronavirus, right? So as you see that, and it kind of comes up close, right? Then that helps our attitude adjust and helps our minds wrap around the size of this thing, right? What Dr. Dean is working on, her actual project right now is she's working on a coronavirus vaccine evaluation with the World Health Organization. Now, do you know what her job is as a biostatistician is she's trying to create models for how to make the, the vaccine available all over the world to all different kinds of uh, circumstances, people living in a variety of, of uh, cultural circumstances. This is her job. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. I hear in her comments, I hear my concerns. I wonder right along with her, how long will this take? How will we know when it's truly safe? How will businesses, restaurants, schools, theater, and churches know it's safe to reopen and resume meeting? This is what all of these groups are working on. When she was being interviewed, I thought this was classic. When she was being interviewed, Dr. Dean was actually walking around the block with her two young children. They're running all over the place. They're bouncing off uh, all around her. And they're, they're actually competing for her attention during the interview, which was perfect. Because I think what, what she modeled for us is, I'm trying to do my job in the midst of the same circumstances that you're in. But she is the one who said this, it is stressful. It's going to take adjustment for a lot of families. But to be honest, it's just too early, given what's still ahead, to be asking how long. And she's the one who said, it's like asking a fireman, when can you move back in, but your house is still on fire? So I want you to think about Dr. Witte and Dr. Dean. His he was tone deaf to the medical concern, which is a little odd because he's chief medical officer, but he was spot on with the social concern. We do struggle with undefined suffering. We don't know how long it's gonna, gonna, gonna last, but, but don't you think that's an opening for faith, hope, and love? Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But now let's take Dr. Dean. Dr. Dean says, it's too early to ask how long. We need to focus on the what and how, not the time limit. What am I going to do and how am I going to go about it? Now, you know there are some particularly hard-hit countries, counties, and cities that have already get, uh, created sheltering. Have you heard that term? Sheltering measures. This is to restrict people from getting out, gathering, or uh, risking being an undetected carrier of the virus. 
some people, including government officials, have mocked these measures and related them to some myriad of conspiracy theories? Come on. This is short-sighted at best, irresponsible, and self-serving at worst. To mock the people who've given their lives, epidemiologists, virologists, biostatisticians, infectious disease doctors, to mock their efforts to keep us safe, that's very, very irresponsible. What we're looking to is, is our, uh, our own lives, our own neighborhoods, our own families, our own churches, our own communities, our own elected leaders doing everything they can to lean into the research that's available to us and to really make a difference. You see, when we don't take this serious, it has profound impact. I want to give you three. Think about the grocery store. When we do a run on the grocery store and we get way more than we need, I think that's normal. Yeah, I do. I think that first round where we've lined up with like six pack horses to carry things home for the next nine months, right? I think that's normal. We're worried because we don't know what's happening. But is it loving? Is it responsible? Here, 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 listen. Does it fulfill the golden rule? You see, some stores have already taken measures right now that they are uh, uh, making a particular hour of shopping exclusively available to senior citizens. No one else is allowed in the store. So that the store is less crowded. There's less chance of someone falling, less chance of someone getting knocked over by a cart. Yes, yes, that's what fear does. I'm not saying people are bad. I'm not saying that, that, that they're trying to do the wrong thing. But see, this is what fear does is fear moves us out of our cognitive, creative thinking, loving brain and gets us back into that reptilian lizard brain that we stop even thinking about the grandmothers and the grandfathers and the families in our community that are taking care of their aging parents at home or the families that have family members that are disabled. Now, come on, once we start talking about it right, once we put faces and names with it, there's something that just clicks in gear and says, right, right, what am I doing? Why are we doing it this way? We're not in the business of hoarding. We're not in the business of piling up for Armageddon. We're in the business about thinking about each other and thinking about our community. You're that kind of person. I know I want to be that kind of person. So let's live that out. Not only grocery stores, but think about the economy. The Chicago Board of Options Exchange that was founded in 1973 created what's called a volatility index. Those who are in the economic sector know this as VIX, V-I-X. And this creates models for investors to navigate market shifts, swings, including what happens when people are consumed by fear and temporarily panic. Now that's forward thinking, right? For people to actually create a model, an index, to try to manage and, and think about investment panic. But once again, it doesn't just impact investors. It impacts every publicly traded company. It impacts all commodities. It impacts hourly workers. So we've got to learn how through love to connect the dots, right? So grocery store and economy. But there's also medical care. Dr. Glenn Rupp who's the Executive Director of Emergency Behavioral and Observation Services at St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange County, California. He made this observation. He said, we are facing two key risks in the hospital industry. The first challenge is just misinformation that results in people thinking that are a higher risk than they actually are. But the second challenge is that this belief means they're coming to the emergency room unnecessarily and we are not in a place where we can then treat those people who do need to be there. Now, you understand, he's not minimizing the risk because he's not even at this point talking about the medical component of it, right? He's talking about what fear is doing to people. See, that's what we're talking about. So these three examples, getting your groceries, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the volatility index in the economy, uh, 
an emergency room at your local hospital. What are we trying to say? What we're trying to say is that fear doesn't serve us as well as we think it does. It has a purpose, but, but there's got to be more to us than just a fear response. So I'm thinking that maybe that's why these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. How do those function? Well, faith says that we're not alone in this. One of the very last things Jesus promised is, look, I'm going to be with you always. But will Jesus be with us always? Well, think about this. In John 1 and verse 14, it says that God, the Word, became flesh and dwelled among us. I love the message translation of John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. It says, Jesus came to the neighborhood, right? And he dwelled with us. In Hebrews chapter 2, it literally says that Jesus fellowshiped humanity. He became common with humanity. He wrapped himself in our skin. So in the Gospels, we read about Jesus being hungry, tired, needing time alone, needing time to pray by himself, wanting to have private conversations as well as group interaction. We read about him having dinner with his friends and enjoying it. You see, Jesus modeled for us how God is with us. He suffers with us. He rejoices with us. So faith says we're not alone. Hope. Hope says we're going to get through this. Hope says that there will be a victory. Hope says that to the glory of God, that the church will, through this, show its love like never before. We will pray, serve, and give like never before. Our neighbors will know our love for the Lord like never before. Our neighbors will know the hope that is in our hearts like never before. You do realize that people are going to come out of the other side of this thing closer to God, in a close relationship with God. Some that have never known a relationship with God are going to find it during this crisis. And not only the rest of their life, but generations will be touched by how God worked through this. Hope is alive and hope is real. Uh, Aristotle, who kind of wallpapered and carpeted the first century uh, world with his uh, uh, philosophy, you know, he lived in the fourth century BC, but by the time of Jesus, literally the culture was just carpeted and wallpapered with Aristotle's thinking. The Greco Roman culture was flooded with his influence. And one of the things he talked about was he said, you know, when we think about how do we know what we know, of course, we have an interpretation of the present, right? We're interpreting what's happening around us. But he also talked of this idea of the truth of the past and the truth of the future. It's not just the moment. We can look into the past. Now, some people say, well, you, you, you know, the, uh, the past is 2020. <laughs> I have learned that looking back at the past is not 2020. People can mess up the past just like they mess up anything else. But the past is beneficial. Why don't we say it like that? That there's truth that can come out of the past. So we can look back, for instance, at viruses that, come, that, that we have on recorded history that we understand. We can look even to the 20th century to the Spanish influenza, the great influenza of 1917, 1918. We can read that research. And I've been blessed to be immersed in that research to, to see how Research hospitals and doctors and population begin to react and move together to solve it. What a blessing it was to read that history and to see how people came together to solve that worldwide explosion of a virus. But even more recently, as we think about the viruses that we've encountered just in the last 20 years, we can take benefit from the past. But, but, but I want to get to something. Aristotle talked about the truth of the future, prolepsis. It's this idea that in the future, there is truth that we can access for how we approach things right now. One of the most important proleptic statements in all of Scripture is in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, where it says that someday every nation, every tribe, every language, all of us as one are surrounding the throne of God, celebrating in victory. That is the future but we need to bring that future as a truth to influence 
our present time. So rather than getting drawn into these uh, uh, conspiracy theories and pointing the finger, well, it's probably these people's fault or these people's fault or these people's fault. How about if we look to the future and say, what's it going to look like when we get to the other side of this thing? How are we going to come out of this? So one of the beautiful uh, uh, things that we were sharing about with the production crew before we started this podcast today was this. What is that first Sunday going to be like when we all are back together? Oh my goodness. What an explosion of joy all over the world when people get to be restored to physical fellowship with one another. See, that's what we're talking about, looking to the future. Faith and hope. But the last is love. And love requires action. A best-selling author, Don Miguel Ruiz, said it this way, a moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind. But a moment of clarity followed by action is a pivotal moment in our life. You see, love isn't love until we act on it. That's what is required. So love means we make that phone call, we send that email, we send that text. Think of all the corporations around America who have decided to respond to continue paying their hourly employees, to continue paying their employees, and taking care of their medical benefits. This is huge. Think about all the sports franchises who had to cancel their seasons, but they said, we will take care of all of our employees. Not just talking about the players or the athletes, they're talking about the hourly employees. This is brilliant. I've talked to my my children and, and uh, the, uh, uh, their spouses and their friends, it's unbelievable the way that companies are responding. And the companies are stressed. They're stressed, but people are making a great difference. I got to tell you the coolest story as we kind of wrap this up. I got to tell you the coolest story. So one of our older, experienced members of our church, right? I don't know if she wants me to call her a senior citizen, right? But she's Got, got a few decades under her belt, right? She was thinking about all of this. She's been living without her wonderful husband. She's married for over 60 years. She's survived him, and she's kind of facing this thing with the typical worries that you might imagine. And then as the Word of God began to speak into the moment for her, and she began to listen to faith, hope, and love, and it began to settle her fears and open opportunities, she began to ask, what could we do? Well, she and her adult children have a favorite sports grill near their house. They went and ordered pizzas, took the pizzas to the sports grills, which is closed for customers, took it to the owner, the manager, and all their employees, gave them the pizzas, and then gave the manager money to disperse to all the employees to help them with their expenses. That's something that, from our, that someone from our church did. I think that's exciting. Another member of our church I called a neighbor that lives just down the road from them. This neighbor's been in cancer treatment, and it's really been tough anyway. They said they felt like they've been quarantined for months anyway. And he called him up and he said, listen, I'll get out and get anything for you. Is there anything you need? They said, as a matter of fact, we could use some half and half milk. He said, any particular brand, they said, any brand will do. He ran to the store. He got that half and half milk, and then he thought a little further. He knows they are deeply, deeply faithful followers of Christ. So he came back by the church building. He got some individually wrapped communion cups, and he took them to him with a little note inside that said, no disrespect for your tradition. If this isn't the way you take communion, I understand. But I know how important it is to you. And I just want you to know that this has been prayed over and blessed. Well, not only were they overwhelmed by that kindness, but they went online. They watched the service last week. They talked about how it ministered to their hearts and gave them faith, hope, and love. See, these are the kinds of things that are happening. So as we wrap this up, we, we know there's a lot of questions, right? But the reason that there's a lot of answers is because there's a lot of questions. Not every answer fits every person exactly the same way. If you're an infectious disease specialist, you're looking for a particular set of answers because you're asking 
a particular set of questions. If you're a sociologist, a psychologist, an anthropologist, you're looking at another set of extremely important questions that yield different kinds of answers. If you're a person of faith, you're looking to these two groups to inform wise decisions, right? Right? But we're most importantly, we're looking to the God of faith, hope, and love to navigate this thing. I want to uh, give you a passage of Scripture that I think will help. In Luke chapter 7, uh, John the Baptist is having a hard time. You remember he was Jesus' cousin, and John's job was a front runner. He went before Jesus and told everyone, hey, the Messiah's coming. But as time went on, John ran afoul of Herod, a terrible king, ended up in prison, and his life was close to ending. John was struggling. He was struggling with how it was playing out. You realize now it's social distancing. He's in prison. He doesn't get to go touch base with Jesus. He doesn't even get to have physical contact with his own disciples. So he sends them to go say to Jesus, man, is, are you the one? It doesn't look like it's playing out like I thought it should. How long is it going to last? When are you going to make your move? All of these things were questions. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, first of all, John, remember the scriptures. Scripture said it was actually going to look like this. It does look like this, that the blind are being given sight, that the lame are walking, that people are being healed, that prisoners are being set free, that justice is prevailing, that the gospel is being shared. So John, in the midst of your pain, do remember that this is the picture that God painted. Secondly, John, be careful not to stumble over the momentary circumstances. I know it's tough, but keep your eyes focused on the big picture of what God is doing. So that's part of the scripture, but here's the next part. So then Jesus turned to his followers and said, you know what, what'd you come to see? When you all went out there to see John the Baptist, what'd you imagine? Did you imagine some guy putting on a big feast in the desert? You imagine a guy in royal robes? Well, when you got there, you didn't get that, did you? John was wrapped in camel's hair and was eating locusts, right? You didn't get what you thought you were going for. But he said, I'm telling you, there's never been anyone like John before. John was exactly who God called John to be. Jesus says, just like I'm who God called me to be. Now the question is, will you be who God calls you to be? Jesus says, sometimes people looked at John and wrote him off. Jesus says, sometimes people look at me and write me off. You know, the truth is that'll happened today, but listen to the last thing Jesus says. He says, wisdom will be proved right by her children. People who navigate tough times wisely are an awesome witness for God, the God of faith, hope, and love. In a companion passage in John chapter 7 and verse 24, Jesus said, quit judging by what you can see by appearances. Quit judging by appearances and make a right judgment. So we need wisdom, not just answers. We need wisdom, the wisdom that comes from faith, hope, and love. So thank you for joining us for that. I've got three quick questions that were shared, and I want to take a moment on them. The first one is, if a church doesn't meet together, does it mean that we don't trust God to keep us safe from disease. So you understand the question. We know scripture says that we should meet together, right? Right? That's crystal clear in scripture. And scripture also tells us to trust God. So if we don't meet together, are we not trusting God? Well, I think that's an important question, right? But I think one of the things that this coronavirus can help us with is binary, is framing something in a binary way. If we do something, it's either right or it's wrong, rather than if we make a decision based on the best information we have at the time, that it could be a faithful response. So what we're looking for is a faithful response. So let me give you a little insight from Jesus, and then we'll go to question two. Insight from Jesus is, how many times does the Bible say that people were threatening his life so he either didn't go back to that region or 
How many times did he go to that region, but he stayed on the outskirts of the region? How many times did he go to a feast, but he went up later rather than on the front end? How many times did he just walk away from the crowd when they were threatening his life? Shouldn't Jesus have just stayed in the middle of the threat so he could prove he trusted God? Or did Jesus model for us that different circumstances can call for different faithful responses? Now, that leads into the second question. How do we guard against suspicion when others make different decisions than we make? So, if someone decides to go to window work and not work remotely and your company has said they support either one, well, if you feel safer not going in and someone feels okay under the circumstances to go in, how do we keep from being suspicious of them. If some people say, you should only order your groceries online, that's the only safe way to do it. And someone else says, I think I'm going to go to the store. I'm just going to be cautious and wash well. Why would we be suspicious? Well, we might be suspicious if someone is obviously self-serving. We might be suspicious if someone is trying to stir up anxiety. We might be suspicious if someone is mocking the various ways that we could guard against being undetected carriers of the virus. We might be suspicious because we think, well, that's just foolish and dangerous. But when people are making measured decisions, given the same information that that you have, and the options are there, they just choose a different option, but both options are offered by your school, by your company, uh, uh, through the ministries you're, you're involved in, A faithful response would be to try to understand what someone is doing and why they're doing it and be very slow to judge from your suspicion or automatically write them off as someone who either doesn't care or is too worried. So we have to guard against suspicion. The second or the third and final question has to do with How can I help without causing more issues? I want to give you an example that I think fits this very well. I knew a family recently that went through a very difficult tragedy, and that tragedy has caused them so much emotional pain that they, before the coronavirus, they kind of hunkered down in their home because they didn't know how to navigate the pain publicly. Through a conversation with this family and hearing their hurt and hearing their worry, well, one of the things that kind of surfaced was is that they weren't eating like they should. So I asked the question, what about if people from our church could just deliver food to your front doorstep? Under the uh, uh, social distancing guidelines of the coronavirus, they're not supposed to make contact anyway, so they could drop it off and you would not have to go through the pain of trying to navigate, explaining what's going on in your family. Isn't that kind of a good outcome, a a little bit of a win-win, that they could help you and you wouldn't have to go into a place of vulnerability that you're not ready for, they were like, yeah, that would really help. But they were worried that due to the virus, no one would sign up to bring them meals. I got an email later that day from one of our elders' wives. So many people signed up to take them meals that the first several weeks were covered within less than half an hour. People wanted to help without hurting. And if we have conversations, we'll probably discover how to do that. So as I mentioned earlier, if you'll go on nacfc.org or lovefirst.org, there's a place for you to submit your questions. And at the end of each podcast, we'll take a few moments for question and answer. So as we close out, I look around to Caleb and Abby and Nolan. Is there anything we need to cover before we close? All right, thank you all for joining us. Remember to like and subscribe, and we'll look forward to touching base with you next week.